All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, get started if that's all right. Um, today, I, or my name is Andy, by the way, I'm a graduate student here in this. Hello. <laughs> um, I have the honor of introducing our visiting speaker today, uh, Dr. McKenzie, who joins us all the way from Pennsylvania. Uh, we actually had a great uh, discussion in the graduate student lunch hour today. Actually, it was about an hour and a half, and we had a whole lot of questions. It could have gone for a lot longer, but she said we had to come back for the seminar to hear the rest of the story. So we're excited to hear the rest of it. Um, so yeah, as I said, uh, Dr. McKenzie comes from uh, the, the Pennsylvania, but Pennsylvania State University, uh, where she serves as the uh, director for the Plant Institute, as well as a she's the Huck Chair for Functional Genomics and a professor in biology and in plant sciences. Um, her lab specifically focuses on um, environmental signaling, um, DNA methylation and epigenetic, uh, epigenetics in plants, and uh, recently has been applying computational biology techniques to try to um, understand some of these complex mechanisms. So with that, I will hand the mic over to Dr. McKenzie, and let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you. The um, one thing that Andy didn't mention that I will mention is that my original training, graduate level training, is in horticulture. I say that so that those students in the audience realize that you really never know where your career will take you and what you think you want to do where you stand now may be vastly different for what you decide you want to do as you grow and mature in your careers. Because I never thought I'd be here when I was where you are now. So um, I, I do have a, a story to tell that I think you might find uh, really interesting. I myself find it interesting. And in fact, as I say that, I don't pat myself on the back. I feel very much that I'm sort of the 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 passive deliverer here of Mother Nature's story, because so much of what I know about this has been serendipitous. It's really not anything we're creating. It's very much stepping back and just letting, you know, a natural system tell us um, where we are. So I need to just get these to move forward. Okay, so, so let me tell you how I see plant responses to their environment. What we know agriculturally speaking, <clears throat> is that the traits that we care the most about, the traits that are the most difficult to access, are those that have a strong genotype by environment interaction, as breeders always refer to it. You know, a strong G by E is always a problem for a trait. Why? Because it means that when you breed a, a trait for a particular environment, if you work in Iowa, and then you attempt to grow that variety in Texas, you know, it's just not going to perform well. And in fact, for things like strawberry, you literally have to grow practically a few miles from each other, different varieties, because they are so genotyped by, or they're so influenced by their environment. So when you think about G by E traits, they're known as complex traits. That means that they are multi-genic, but more importantly, they're often epigenetically influenced. The, the E part of G by E means that a response of a plant to its environment is largely an epigenetic response. And that's what I want to get at is how do we understand heritable chromatin changes that influence gene expression by heritable, meaning that plants can undergo changes. You, you know the combination of genes you're dealing with, but they can undergo phenotypic changes that will actually uh, be heritable. And we know this from just studying in ecological studies, realizing that a certain genotype grown under a certain environment, particularly if it's a stressful environment, will pre-adapt their progeny for that stress eventually. And I, I put dandelion up here because it's particularly epigenetically influenced in that way, which is a bad deal for us because we can't get them out of our lawns. And, and so what we need, I would argue, to really understand G by E, complex traits, environmental interactions with crops, will be a, first a very powerful model system and by powerful, I mean it has to provide unambiguous information that's reproducible about epigenetic reprogramming. So that means we have to be able to go in and induce epigenetic changes in a reproducible manner so that we can step back and ask, what have we done, and study it. 
And the number one problem with epigenetics in general is that it isn't particularly reproducible. You know, you, you all, the people that I met today were talking about, you know, we once saw this, you know, one time we saw this, you know, that's the way, that's the nature of epigenetics is that it isn't highly reproducible. And you often don't know what you did to get that effect. So it's got to be a really unambiguous uh, 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 capability. And the second thing that we need, I would argue, is a means of identifying epigenetic changes that are verifiably treatment associated, meaning that after we create epigenetic changes, however we do it, we have to be able to unravel what we did and be able to discern which changes we see are really the effect of our perturbation, whether we subjected it to drought or to microbial um, infection or to our epigenetic reprogramming uh, process. Those sound really obvious, but in fact, those are not trivial requests. And in fact, I would argue we have relatively few of these anywhere. One of the best studied in, uh, systems, in my opinion, is in C. elegans, the worm. It's a great system for epigenetic reprogramming, phenomenal in all of its ways, but it doesn't help plants much. So um, for us to study this in plants, we, our, our story starts with the way I start. I'm actually an organelle biologist, not an epigenetics expert. There's no such thing. Um, an organelle biologist, meaning that I'm really interested in the way plants sense their environment and the way multicellular organisms in general have used their organelles, mitochondria and plastids as vehicles for signals. And the reason for that, of course, is they are the two energy generating systems in a cell and so they are, in fact, very sensitized to environment and have that capability of, of signaling status. So sensory plastids are plastids in plants that are different from mesophyll chloroplasts, the ones you learned in biochemistry 101, responsible for photosynthesis, have, have, you know, handling uh, carbon assimilation as well as electron transport. They're about 30% the size of a mesophyll chloroplast, so they're much smaller. They show paranuclear associations and they're highly dynamic. That means that when a plant sees stress, let's say high light flashes, they will actually physically move. You can watch them in real time toward the nucleus and actually be, as you can see up here, immediately abutting the nucleus in physical proximity or attachment. And where I have a little, the second little arrow down below, uh, represent stromules. They send out these little arms, these little, um, you know, projections from the plastid that are able to, in fact, interact. And you can see plastid to plastid interaction there with my arrow. You may not be able to see it in the back, but I can see it up here. Um, and they're, you know, they're basically because you're seeing green fluorescent protein within it, you can basically visualize it. Those, that ability to put out those stromules, that ability to move up and hug with the nucleus, all of these things are environmentally responsive. They're all within, in this case, the epidermis. But these sensory plastids have uh, their own features. And in fact, you'll also find these sensory plastids or something very much like them in the vascular parenchyma, the live part of the vascular tissue. You'll also find them in the meristem and you'll find them in reproductive tissues. I would argue those tissues are all vitally important to a plant's interaction with its environment. Just to tell you one little detail more, it turns out that sensory plastids have their own proteome. And what I mean by that is the vast majority of proteins that you would find in a plastid are nuclear encoded. And so it means that cell to cell, the nucleus can decide what their plastid protein complement will be and they in fact do regulate this. So if you looked at what proteome you'd find in a plastid that's down in the root, it'll be fundamentally different than what you'd find in a mesophyll chloroplast that's busy doing photosynthesis and the like. Well, in the case of sensory plastids, it turns out we were able to separate them. And the way we separated them is that we took a sensory plastid specific protein. We figured that out. We went back to its gene. We took its whole gene, including its native promoter, and hooked it up to green fluorescent protein and put it back in the plant. What that means now is you can see sensory plastids are fluorescing green because that's the only place that protein is accumulating. And the mesophyll chloroplast, one, one cell below, you're looking down on a leaf for that confocal, is in fact just red. Well, then the beautiful thing is that I can use flow cytometry separating for green and red, and now I can separate those out. 
and then I can do a full proteome of them. I say I, it's the collective eye of my lab because actually Jesus Beltran did this work and he did a beautiful job. Down below, you're seeing the TEM showing the size of the mesophyll chloroplast and some of its ultrastructural differences from the epidermal sensory plastid. These are you know, quite different organelles. And if you were to separate the proteome, what you find, I'm just looking at, basically these are ranked by enrichment terms, okay? So those, uh, net, those, those pathways for which enrichment was highest, what you'd find in a mesophyll chloroplast is exactly what you'd expect. You find photosynthesis, uh, redox, response to cold, et cetera, all below those. But of course, photosynthesis and oxidation reduction being the two top hits. If you go down to a sensory plastid, photosynthesis is considerably further down on the list. And that is because probably their day job is no longer just the grinding out of, of carbon assimilates. What they're really responsible for is probably much more of an uh, environmental sensing capability. Now, I know more than I'm telling you, and I won't have, this isn't really a plastid talk, so I'm not going to go into details about it. But we do know that they, in fact, have a proteome with lots of special protein. Let me just say that these little stromules, they are light responsive. So the day-night fluctuations, you'll find lots of stromules in the day, and then you'll find that they all recede at night. That was Patty Zambriski's work. So other people have studied stromules. The interesting thing is many of them didn't realize that they were looking at a specialized organelle type. They just assumed everything is the same. And the only reason they chose epidermis is because they're doing confocal and it's so much easier. So I'm, that's the part I'm telling you that people didn't realize. But it turns out that there are, with these specialized plastids, specialized proteins, things that you find accumulating and functioning in particular ways in these plastids. And the first one I'll introduce you to is a gene called MSH1. And I want you to know about this gene because I'm going to talk about it during my talk today. MSH1 is a DNA binding protein. You will only find it in sensory plastids. If I overexpress it in a mesophyll chloroplast, the plant will be very unhappy or it will figure out how to turn my transgene off. What I want you to see is that there are little dots sitting inside the nucleoid there. And that's because this is a DNA binding protein. Its day job is really to suppress illegitimate recombination, to not let recombination go out of control. But if I deplete the sensory plastid, if I knock that gene out or I downregulate it using RNAi, the effect is to destabilize the plastid genome, thus creating a signal to the nucleus that says things are not good here and epigenetic reprogramming. And that's what I'm gonna tell you about today is my little system for creating epigenetic change. But there, there are more. This is PPD3, a putative interactor with MSH1. You'll only find that accumulating mostly near the meristem. Remember I told you those plastids are there too. And, and PPD3 is involved in uh, reactive oxygen uh, modulation. And so it functions in a different pathway. And yet, if we knock it out, we also can create epigenetic changes in the nucleus. Q1 is a, also a gene. It works in plastid metabolism. It is in the sensory plastid. And um, if I knock that out, I also can create epigenetic change in the nucleus. And the fourth I'll tell you about is cell one, which was characterized uh, by Barry Pogson in Australia. And cell one, he didn't realize at the time he did that analysis, is also a sensory plastid protein. He's probably really annoyed I'm presenting this to you and it's even data that he didn't have, but it's a sensory plastid protein. And where he discovered it was through drought tolerance. It actually is a part of conditioning drought tolerance. And the signal that occurs when cell one is knocked out is a signal that, um, it, it, that creates changes in microRNA stability in the nucleus. So we know of at least four, and there were probably more sensory plastid specific proteins involved in environmental sensing and signaling by ways that are unconventional to the literature. So let me tell you how MSH1 works. This is an interesting system because I'm gonna tell you in a rabbitopsis, but I'm gonna tell you before I even say that, what I tell you is applicable to any species, any plant species we know of, uh, at least uh, let's say angiosperm plant species. So uh, you can start with a wild type plant and then you can downregulate or knock out MSH1. And what you will see is quite a lot of variation in growth and it's variation with a capital V. So there are gonna be 
uh, uh, stress responses, growth rate, maturation, flowering, even grown under short day length, they will start behaving like they are perennial plants. That's just Columbia Zero over there. It's a seven month old plant at that point. You know, lots of strange pathways are influenced by this. MSH1, if we use RNAi to create this effect, the next generation, that RNAi transgene will segregate away. And when it segregates away, you expect MSH1 to go back to normal and your phenotype to go back to normal. But no, you get memory. And in fact, that is the definition of epigenetic memory, that you create a perturbation. And then when you put everything right, the perturbation remains. That is how we, in my lab, define memory. And so what, what you see in the stress memory, we call that state, state two, is you find a condition that you can see is very slow growing. It's lighter in, in green and in chlorophyll content. It's delayed in flowering and it is sustaining stress response. That plant thinks it's under drought stress. It thinks it's under heat stress. It thinks it's under light stress. It's sustaining this. The interesting thing about that memory plant is that all of its progeny will give rise to memory and all of their progeny will give my rise to memory. It is highly penetrant, highly stable, indefinitely. Creating memory lines is something my lab does in their sleep. It's very easy. It's as simple as you go in, downregulate MSH1, put MSH1 back in and you're off into memory. Now, you can also see that we call something that looks wild type coming from the same population, non-memory. About 80% of your plants when you do this experiment will be non-memory, 20% will be memory, the, the full phenotype. The 20% that are memory will breed true and give you memory indefinitely. The non-memory are also epigenetically modified. You will often need another cycle before they reach memory. That implies to us there's some sort of a threshold to getting into this memory state. They haven't quite reached it, it takes them longer. Now, here's the interesting thing. You can take the MSH1 mutant and you can cross it to wild type. Or even more intriguingly, you can use it as rootstock and graft wild type to the top of the plant and collect seed from that cross or graft. And those plants will show enhanced vigor and resilience relative to wild type. Yields that'll be in our Rabidopsis 25% or higher relative to wild type, above ground biomass enhanced, et cetera. That too is reproducible. So in all of these plant species, we have carried this out. In fact, we're involved in a collaboration with Ahmed on strawberry. He made that happen for us. Um, but this actually works this way for every species that we've worked with so far. Now, the interesting thing is, that the MSH1 effect that I just described to you is dependent on the RNA-directed DNA methylation pathway. That is the pathway known in plants to be responsible for de novo cytosine methylation in the genome. By de novo, I mean it wasn't there, and then I did something, and suddenly it's there. That's different from you have methylation in your genome right now. And next, or, or a plant does, and next generation, of course, there will be methylation. And next generation, that reinforcement of methylation is not necessarily the RDDM pathway. But now you see it, now you don't, that is RDDM. So the RDDM pathway is responsible for what, we, what we're doing here. And we know this because, for example, if you take a MSH1 mutant, but you make it a double mutant with histone deacetylase 6, HDA6, a component of the RDDM pathway, that's lethal at 12 hour day length. Okay. So we know that everything I just described to you is dependent on histone deacetylase 6 being present there. We also know that, for example, to create that stress memory I talked about, DRM2, which is the, the uh, God bless you, methylate, uh, the, uh, uh, methyl transferase from RDDM is also uh, necessary. What we also know is that we can use dicer like 2, 3, 4 triple mutant together with MSH1 in that rootstock and no longer transmit those signals. All of that says this whole phenomenon relies on the machinery of the RDDM pathway, the epigenetics pathway of plants. So, why is this important? Because that means that we've now advertently or inadvertently created a system that allows us to do detailed analysis 
of the creation of epigenetic states. And I just defined to you four states. State one is the MSH1 mutant. State two is the, the, the memory of that. State three is the uh, graft progeny, enhanced growth. And state four is the crossed progeny. They're all distinct epigenetically. So that allows us to create these at will very easily. Uh, undergraduates, students, high school students in our lab are creating these all the time. But here's the really important part. Because we find that these are RDDM dependent, we can exploit that. So now we can apply genetics to the study of epigenetic phenomena. And that's where our power comes from. So let me point out to you that a minute ago I said, when we graft a plant to MSH1, the progeny will be enhanced in growth. Now I'm telling you, if I add DCL234 mutants with my uh, MSH1 in that rootstock, I no longer see that enhanced growth. What that means to you is that if I go in and I study the epigenetic changes that happened when I had my first graft progeny versus my DCL234 graft progeny, one subtracted from the other tells me what the RDDM targets are, the gene targets for DNA methylation. All the methylation changes that happened in the one that no longer happened in the second now give me the ability to say, I can identify de novo methylation changes that are associated with the MSH1 effect. Do you follow? You see how that works? That's powerful because we don't know of another system that gives us that capability. Now, let me just you know, orient you a little bit to who HDA6 is. So it turns out that when there are environmental changes in a plant, that will create active chromatin. That induces gene expression. You all know that. You all do these, these RNA, uh, RNA-seq experiments. That's what's really happening there. And that activated chromatin after that stress has to be put back, reestablishing homeostasis of that chromatin. HDA6 does that. So if you're going to acetylate uh, histones in order to separate them to open chromatin, uh, chromatin, you have to deacetylate to reestablish them in their normal place. I would argue that MSH1 is likely acting as a proxy to extreme environmental stress and not having HDA6 present overwhelms the system because we know that HDA6 and MSH1 double mutant is lethal but it's only lethal at 12 hour day length. If we shift this and grow everything at 16 hour day length, what happens is that the MSH1 effect is not nearly as strong and we're now able to survive that. Why is that important? Because this actually becomes a, um, a conditional lethal mutant. Every geneticist dreams of having the conditional lethal mutant because it gives you an on off switch for permissive conditions and non-permissive conditions. So you can start studying the details of what's happening. Okay, so that's not very practical. Everything I told you is the background to epigenetics, but now how could we exploit this system in a meaningful way, we horticulturalists? And we started out in tomato. And what we did now is we said, okay, if this works in Arabidopsis the way we think it does, would this actually work in tomato the same way? So we took tomato and we basically transformed a tomato plant with an RNAi construct to downregulate MSH1 in tomato. So now you get a plant that looks really funky and it's clearly stressed out, just as we would expect. Now, can we, for example, use that tomato plant as a rootstock? Could we graft its wild type counterpart as a scion, collect seed, and see an effect? And that's what you're looking at here. This is a 2017 field trial of that material. And this is the outcome. And I'll just kind of orient you that this is the outcome first generation right off of that graft, you know, next generation, second generation coming from first generation, and then third. Two things here. One, I want you to notice that down here, you're looking at the percent of yield over the grafted control as ranging 40%, 31%, 78%. Clearly, there is a yield impact here. And the second thing I want you to notice is that it's heritable. We've actually here, I'm showing you, we've taken it three generations. I took a slide out because I think this talk is already going to be pretty long, but my next slide was going to show you five generations. So basically, this is a heritable phenomenon over five generations that we can keep going.
strictly epigenetic. There's no genetic change here. This is one variety. We go in, we add our MSH1 effect, we come back out, we graft, we're ready to go. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting thing because it tells us that Arabidopsis isn't the only game in town. Other plants know how to do this. The interesting thing is those tomato materials we could then take to Florida and ask uh, Sam Hutton to grow them for us um, in his most debilitating time, which turns out to be August in Florida, not happy tomatoes. And what you see here is basically those are his commercial varieties, heat tolerant and heat sensitive. And then this is my unmodified Rutgers and then my modified. So now we can actually see that in fact, heat tolerance is comparable to what he standardly sees in his material that he selects. That heat tolerance is strictly epigenetic. Like I said, this is nothing other than an epigenetic effect. Okay, so that's, that becomes interesting as well. But now the question becomes, yeah, that's tomato, but may, maybe tomato is unusually plastic. What if we were to put this in another species? So our next species was in canola. In canola, we grow it in Chile, and then we grew it in North Dakota. We nearly got wiped out in North Dakota because in 2022, that was when that drought hit all over the Northern part and in California. And nearly, you know, there were a lot of farmers that really lost big time. So we were in the midst of that. So we tried to turn lemons into lemonade because we're looking for drought tolerance. So this turned into a drought tolerance study for epigenetics. Okay, so when we grew this in Chile, what you're looking at is graft progeny, second generation. In canola, you do your graft, you get the seed off. It's not enough seed to grow. So you grow that one more cycle to do a seed increase and then you go out. So that's why this is generation two. I'm not hiding anything from you. With canola, it's difficult to talk about yield because you don't talk about individual plants like you do in, in tomato. So, what, and, and because it's a very noisy data set. So generally, standardly breeders look for approximately 3% yield gain. That's a really good variety and it takes you a couple of years to get there. So we made our cutoff 5% and just said, how many lines surpass 5%? And that's 48 of these lines exceeded 5% over the check. Um, but let me just tell you, 25% were over 10% of the check. You know, we need some way to kind of relay our data. So what you're looking at are just the individual lines as plots replicated, uh, you know, three to four times. And then over there is the check on the left, 65 replicates of that in this field. So this looks interesting, but let's face it, Chile is really nice conditions for canola. That's why all the growers use it as their off season for, for increasing seed. So then we went to North Dakota. Now with North Dakota, we had to introduce irrigation. Irrigation's not ideal, but it was the only way we could grow anything there. What I want to point out to you is these are the materials that we were, you know, some of these are the materials we were also growing in, uh, in Chile. This is second generation, but it, we're using remnant seed. And what you see is now that 86% of these lines exceeded 5% over the check. So actually, we actually did better here in terms of how these are behaving. We could now ask with canola, something we didn't ask with tomato, would this work in hybrids? What if I just use the epigenetic modified line as one of my parents and then just had an unmodified as my second parent and put it into a hybrid? The reason being that they use CMS and canola and they like, they like hybrids. And so if a grower wants to do this, he or she is almost for sure gonna ask for it in hybrids. So there you can see, we only had six lines with enough seed yield that we could go forward with this, but out of those six, 50% of them exceeded that 5%. And this is remember under these drought conditions. So this looks pretty good to us that actually so far, things look, look nice. Now, soybean, what about soybean? It's sort of the 800 pound gorilla in the room, right? Cause I'm coming from the Midwest. And well, not now, but I, I was. At the time we were doing this in the Midwest, all they care about is corn and soy. Nobody wants to talk about anything else. So we put the system into soybean. And what I wanna to show to you on the right is 60, this is again um, uh, coming from graft progeny. And, and this was big because everything is big in the Midwest when it comes to soybean. Eight location field study, eight replicates of everything per location. And 60% of them are above 5% uh, surpassing the check. 45% are, 10% or above from the check, and then 15% are 15% or above. So this all looks pretty good. In fact, all these are showing some sort of vigor, some sort of yield advantage. And in the case of tomato, we were seeing this enhanced vigor uh, over heat. Uh, 
And so, of course, we can also say that if you were to do this with, um, you know, with these, these materials over several generations, you know, four generations, we could see over on the left, three generations on the right, it seems to hold. So here's the caveat. Notice that I say 11 to 17% yield increase three generations after the graft. That sounds incredible. Notice that on the bottom, I say, that's a 10 entry test. We're displaying the top 60% results. So of course, what about the other 40%? You know, not everything is up there. This is not breeding uniformly. So we're interested in how does epigenetics work? Can you subject it to selection? Because, you know, if you really want to take advantage of this, you have to teach a breeder or a, or a grower how to work with it, right? And so we ourselves don't know that. So now I have to shift to sorghum, which is really where I started. And the reason I started on sorghum is because I was in Nebraska at the time. Nebraska really does grow sorghum well. I would say we're even almost as good as Texas at growing sorghum, even though you put out all the best varieties. And in fact, you're looking at Texas 430 up there. That's the variety that I chose. It's not a variety, it's actually a restore. Uh, it also has a cytoplasmic male sterility system that I think you might've even developed here. At least you, you perfected it here. And so this is the restore that was developed for that system. So the reason I did this was because I thought if this really works, people will want to use a restore to test it on their own materials. Let's use one that they're familiar with. So now, as you can see, we increase yield. Everything looks very good with sorghum as well. But what the reason I use sorghum is I can grow a lot of plants and get plant to plant data information there. So over on the left, what you're seeing is that we grew this first in Havelock. Havelock is the ideal environment. We got good uh, nitrogen, you know, good water supply. These are really happy plants. And what you see there is in gray is the wild type. And then our materials, this is of course coming from crossing with MSH1, look really variable. That's all epigenetic variation. Remember that sorghum is an inbred line. But here's what we did. We went out and we took our F2 and we grew F3 families from every individual F2 plant. And from those F3 families, we looked at identifying the lowest families in yield, the intermediate families, and the highest families in yield. And then from each family, we identified the lowest or the highest performing plant or the intermediate performing plants. We grade, 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 provided this gradation in each class. And the reason you do that is so you can use sort of a retroactive breeding strategy. So now we select everything from those F3s and grow them the next cycle. And then we retroactively say, if we had selected this, what would it have given us if we could select that? So it basically gives you hindsight. So what you're looking at here is the wild type on the left. And then where it says LL and then LI, that means that the line that we selected, the, the, the F3 in, uh, population was low, and then the LI, low individual, out of that low population, and so on. MLMI means a medium line with a medium individual, and so on. And up here is high line, high individual. And what I want to point out to you is that under ideal conditions, the very best plant or the very best performing line would have come from something that we all would have classified as medium line, high individual. There's no way in the world you would have intuitively thought that. You would have actually had to go out and if you wanted to select this, like say for commercial purposes, you would have chosen your medium performing lines, the high individuals with them, and those would be the ones you'd run with. How ridiculous is that? Now, what that says is that basically, Progeny performance cannot be predicted by parental uh, performance, meaning you don't just walk out there and like any standard breeder would do, take your top 5% or your top 10% and expect them to breed true. It doesn't work that way. And in fact, when you take this same population, exactly the same, and replicate it in mead, where we have a very low nitrogen, we have a, we don't have, I'm not there anymore. We used, I used to be a part of a group that had a, a plot that had not been uh, fertilized in 30 years, very, very low nitrogen, and we use it as our marginal land uh, uh, assay. When we did that, the line that was the best was this low line here in blue, medium individual. 
And those lines, those low lines were 65% higher than our other materials in that environment. So what that says that's really important is that epigenetics is a reflection of the bet hedging that mother nature uses. That mother nature put out all of this material and under environment one ideal, this is a guy that's gonna win out. And, and some of the others looked good too. But if you go to a totally different environment, these guys will be the ones that are really going to perform well. There's always going to be variation in there that allows for bet hedging. And so, you know, the story is that progeny performance will not be predictive. So what do we do about that? Because we have to be predictive. There's no way we can operate with just wondering who's going to survive. So what we had to do is we had to develop a systematic way of looking at methylome to phenotype. And if you can decode that, you can make your predictions because now you can go in and look at methylome signatures and know who those guys are that will be the ones you want. And that means we have to turn this into a science. And up to now, it's been a little bit more of a hazy black box approach. So to do this, we first need a system, like I said, that we can use to you know, induce epigenetic states. So we use the MSH1 system because it gives us four states and it incorporates RDDM mutants. Then we have to create a platform for analysis of DNA methylation data. Why do we choose methylation? Because it allows us to look at single nucleotide resolution for where cytosine methylation changes occur. You're never going to have a higher resolution data set than that. But the way that we do this methylome analysis is that we basically evaluate DNA methylation as a probability distribution as opposed to a statistical decision with a cutoff, meaning that for any cytosine methylation, you're not just making a cutoff in your decision of what's methylated and what is not. You're basically treating it as a distribution, and you're looking for the differences in the distribution of your data set from control versus the, frequent, the, the distribution in your data set from your treatment. And what you're looking is add is the non-overlap. You're separating those using something that's called Hellinger's divergence that gives you a measurement that of where do those two, uh, where do the differences exist between those two distributions? Now, the important thing about that is you can also then apply what's called signal detection. And what that allows you to do then is to identify with some certainty that which is signal in your methylome data from that which is background variation. And that background variation is also happening in your, in your controls. So you're just separating control from your treatment, okay? Now, after that, you, you're using uh, machine learning to give yourself confidence that, in fact, the things I'm seeing are real because I can now predict them. And after you do that, the next step is now to understand what we have. So after you've identified methylation, those methylation sites or demethylation sites with the highest probability of being interaction networks. That means we go out and we ask, what genes are those methylation changes happening in? And how are those genes related? And are they operating together? Do they form networks? And if they do, what networks? Okay. So here's what it would look like. If you do the standard uh, conventional method, you'd have methylation that looks like those top bars. And every little poke that goes up is a methyl, a methyl group that's added. Every little poke that goes down is a methylation that was taken away. But you can see it's, it's quite a noisy data set and you can't really discriminate from your control. Down below is, meth, is what comes out of our methyl IT platform. And what I wanna show you is that basically here is what you're reading, much cleaner. And what you're looking at as the control um, is, uh, uh, well, I, I'm not showing you the control, but the control doesn't have any of these. So what you're looking at is where these have all emerged. Those are the sites at which differential methylation occurs for those genes. Now, when you take that information, here's how you now can, can use it. You can take your four states, MSH1, memory, grafted, and our epi lines, four states, and you take all your differentially methylated genes that you've identified, and you overlay them, and you ask, what do they have in common? They have 871 genes 
that underwent changes in methylation in response to all four. Why do I want all four? Because I want to ask the question, although all of those states differentially methylated this same gene, did it methylate differently for state one and differently for state two and altogether differently for state three and differently for state four? So we want those that responded to all four states. Now we ask the question I just asked. So what you're looking at is hierarchical clustering of the methylation variation for those 871 overlapping genes. We're just looking at how much variation was there within those for their methylation data and asking how do they aggregate. And what you find is MSH1 patterns were closer to MSH1 patterns than they were to epiline patterns. And memory was closer to memory than it was to graft and so on. What that says is that exactly what I just said is true. 871 genes underwent methylation changes, but the changes that happened for state one are different and discernible from state two, from state three, and state four. So what am I really saying is that we're decoding the methylome. We're now not just saying what genes underwent methylation change, that's a big deal. We're saying the kinds of methylation changes that happened are state specific. That means we can now start to think about predicting when you see this kind of pattern, you get enhanced growth. When you see this kind of pattern, you get a stress response. Now, you can then take those 871 and you can use a, a k-means clustering approach to identify those genes within that that are most likely to serve as network hubs based on their you know, large numbers of connections to other genes. They're more likely to be key regulators. And now you look at those hubs. And I'm going to tell you three things about this that were very exciting to us. There are 67 genes that make up the core hubs in the MSH1 system. Of those 67 genes, 81% of them are known to be RDDM targets. That means that if I added DCL234 mutant, everything in orange up there would disappear from my data set. So we already know that more than 81% of these are right on target for what we want. Why? Because when MSH1 is perturbed, those genes respond. And when MSH1, I mean, when I take away that perturbation, they disappear. So on, off, on, off gives us confidence that we're looking at something that's de novo and it's clearly associated with this. The other thing that's important is the networks that came up. The one up on the right, response to stress, a duh. Two, you remember, I've got four states. Two of them are heightened stress response. Two of them are heightened growth response. The first pathway we get is response. The second pathway is growth, okay? So that was, that was encouraging and they overlap, meaning we're looking at an intersection between growth and stress. The others, gene expression, spliceosome, histone modification, and chromosome organization, all RDDM. Those are all the epigenetic phenomena that we're looking at. Okay, so, so what we're interested in then is who, who are the players here? And I'll just introduce you to a couple. The first one that was really exciting to us is Splade and its uh, homologous partner, Brahma. Because Splade and Brahma are known to be the genes that sit central to that decision of vegetative or reproductive development. And remember that if a plant is under drought or under stress, what's the first thing it's thinking about? Should I hunker down and get through this? Should I hurry up and flower, put my seed out and get the heck out of here, right? So that made a lot of sense to us. The second set of genes that we were interested in, or the second gene we went after is TOR, target of rapamycin. Why are we interested there? Because TOR is already known to be the gene that basically is part of deciding how much energy you know, my nutrient capabilities do I have and how am I going to target it? And so TOR is known to work in growth antagonistically against SNRK components. Those are the stress response. In that decision of how much energy do I put to stress and, and defense and how much energy do I put to growth? And of course, what I told you was these plants were making that decision. If I'm going to either enhance my growth in, in uh, uh, uh uh, grafting and and um, and crossing, or am I going to hunker down and basically be a stress-responsive plant, which is what we saw in memory? 
So what we really think we have in this whole collection, just to summarize, I won't tell you, there are lots of hits on this list that are very, very exciting, is that we think we're really looking at that pivot point of phenotypic plasticity. Plasticity is a decision a plant makes each and every day of how much of my energy do I give to dealing with the stresses I'm dealing with versus how much do I put into growth and out-competing out my neighbor. And we know that. I was telling some, uh, people during lunch today, I know that because every year, now that I live in Pennsylvania, I take all my house plants outside and I put them under my pergola in the, in the, in the summertime. And they're, they're shaded enough, but they're absolutely thriving there. And then I, of course, make this shift, which I did about three weeks ago, that we're coming indoors. And now we got artificial lighting and now I'm doing the watering and it's going to be hit or miss here. And they know it and they show me that they know it. And they make this transition each and every time with me when I move them. And I can watch all those changes. You know this as well. Either they drop their leaves initially and then they start putting out new growth. All of those are basically these components of deciding what is my environment and how much am I going to adjust what I'm doing? And if you look carefully, they're not single gene effects. They're whole network effects. They're making decisions. Shall I flower? Shall I not? Am I going to drop leaves and put out new growth? Am I going to activate new meristems? You know, they're all those decisions. You know them. You've seen them. Here they are, and they're sitting right in front of you. The beautiful thing is our data told us this. I didn't do any cherry picking here. I took 871 genes, and I just said, who are the networks here? And voila, there they are. So the really important thing is that we no longer have to cherry pick out of methylome data, which has been the standard procedure. We actually can decode these data. Let me go one step further and say, if I was to look at gene expression in these materials, if I just looked at the transcriptome, that's your RNA-seq experiment, only I do it within rich tissue for where I know MSH1 is working, I get what's on the right. But if I go in and do a translatome, and what I mean by that is now I'm using what's called a trap-seq analysis where I'm only using and I'm pulling down the ribosomes in the cells where MSH1 functions, and I'm doing it in a situation where MSH1 is depleted. And now I ask, what genes are differentially expressed in the cells where I've depleted them of MSH1, you get what's on the left. And what I want to point out to you is where the blanks are. I now see nucleosome assembly. I could never see that in an RNA-seq. I now see chromatin silencing. Hello, this is what's going on in those cells. I now see uh, mRNA splicing via spliceosome. What do you think methylome is doing, but now causing alternative splicing of those genes? So, so now all of a sudden I can see validation to the networks I just found by methylation, but I'm seeing them in my gene expression data. Those are basically the same exact uh, geo terms that I, I was dealing with there. Okay, so this is, this is important. I, I also see up there calcium mediated signaling and we are on that because that's exactly how that plastid is sending the signal. So I'm just gonna kind of finish up here, but I just wanna tell you how we read this. So the way that we read this information is that we take, um, you know, as I said, we can look at differential methylation in the different states. So now you're looking at all the different states on the left there, memory and MSH1 and epi lines and, and grafted. And then everything that's in orange is methylated. Everything that's in blue is not methylated. And we're able to, so we just, that's not the way we read our data, but the way we read our data would not be interpretable to you. And down below, you're looking at where the individual cytosine is where we're reading that methylation. What I want to point out to you is these genes that we're looking at are undergoing methylation in precise patterns at precise sites so that they actually form these motifs around the cytosine site. So an RDDM target is specific methylation at a site that sits in a motif that's identifiable and recognizable. What that in, implies is that there's, there are features of chromatin that tell us not just whether you, you're gonna methylate or not methylate, but where. And so that repatterning we think is vital to deciding how alternative splicing might occur. And you know, up, up on the left, I'm just showing that when we add DCL234, many of those sites then disappear. So, so uh, this level, of decoding allows us to see not only the cytosine that's vital to it, but for instance, a, a T that is conserved in all sites we've seen 
right next to it. Or for example, a G that is basically conserved in all sites next to it. The fact that we can find this interdependence between nucleotides suggests that methylation sites are not random, that in fact, there are features there that are basically telling the machinery of RDDM, this is, this is where we want to see this happen. So what you do now, what we're doing right now is we're creating, creating a, a browser where we could actually go through and read all of these. Up above, you're looking at a, a particular gene. And now our 67 hub genes, we're just looking at one of them in red there. Down below that, you're looking at the RDDM target motifs. Those are those motifs that are sites that we know are targeted, uh, where it would disappear from this data set when we add DCL234. Down below that, you can see the small RNA cluster, which sits up ahead of that gene here. And that's where small RNAs are made to target this gene. And then down below that, you're looking at the differential methylation in the case of this particular memory uh, data set. And so now you can see how you can align those with much of those data. So this actually gives us the ability to now scroll through, look at individual genes, find out where they're methylated, find out where their, their target sites are, find out where the small RNAs are that are targeting those genes, and then get some understanding of how alternative splicing might be occurring there. And, and with that kind of information, this is the sort of system that we, we contemplate. Imagine if you could now create epigenetically altered plants and then follow that with particular markers, methylome markers that tell you the guys that are gonna most likely be the best for use. And now move those into a system where you could use them as graft uh, uh, rootstocks or as parents in a cross, knowing that you selected them based on their molecular features. And now from there, you basically then take you know, the seed or whatever you're going after, you'd have it you know, multiple generations and you'd be assured you had it multiple generations because you made the right choice at the beginning. That which had the full profile you need to predict this kind of an outcome. That's what we envision. That's what we're working toward is the ability of actually manipulating this in a way and decoding this in a way that it could be a practical plant breeding system. And imagine this looks so much easier than what I started with, right? I mean, we're doing this Arabidopsis funky deal, but imagine all you've got to do is just come up with your altered material, screen them with something that would be fairly straightforward and hopefully automated, run them through the grafting process and know what you were going to have as the outcome. I mean, we're not there, but it's a dream. And that's, that's where we're aiming. And with that, I just want to thank you for listening. And I want to acknowledge the people that are doing all this hard work for me. Um, Isaac is a graduate student in our group. Xiaodong was a scientist working with us who's now taken a lab in China, but he still works with us. Hardik and Robercy are our experts in developing the methyl IT system. Um, uh, Kyla Morton and Mike Fromm work with a company called Epicrop Technologies. It's a small startup company that works with us. And they give us the vehicle by which we can move things to the field because I can't do that in an academic institution. And then Mike Axtell works with us in the small RNA biology that we study, figuring out where those clusters are and how they might be operating. So thank you. Big story, I know. We have about five minutes for questions. Um, just a reminder, if somebody here asks a question, if you could repeat it in the mic so that people Yes. Good question. So the question is really that when we were dissecting this in Arabidopsis, we're using different RDDM mutants for, for showing different steps, as opposed to just using one set of mutants and confirming all of that. Um, there is no state specificity. In other words, all of the phenomenon will be HDA6 sensitive or DCL. DCL234 is, is the best to use because it's specific for small RNA. HDA6 is a little more broad. The thing is the HDA6 double mutant um, is really valuable for us for a certain purpose. 
The problem with DCL234, we would have used it for all the transitions, but remember I told you to make memory, I have to use RNAi. RNAi depends on small RNAs to downregulate MSH1. I can't use DCL234 uh, there, so I have to use DRM2 instead. Does that make sense? So remember that to use RNAi, that's how I create memory. I, I downregulate MSH1 and then I remove the RNAi transgene and I see memory. The problem is I can't do any of that if I don't have RDDM working because RNAi depends on small RNAs. So as a consequence, I can't use DCL234. So I use DRM2, but I, I predict them all to be dependent on all of the same. And we have used DRM2 as well in our grafting and so on. So there, there is no specificity for different stage. I'm just showing you that the, the whole system is RDDM dependent, and I'm also giving you more information. HDA6 is a lethality, DRM2 simply, or, or uh, DCL234 simply uh, uh, eliminates the grafting effect. Yeah, those stages and those genes are more or less arbitrary. Yeah, they're just for the design of the experiment so that we can actually do it. Does, does that make sense? MSH1 mutant is absolutely not lethal. That's what we work with on a regular basis. The only time we use RNAi instead of the full mutation is when we want to create memory. So I put in the transgene, I downregulate MSH1, and then I, put, I segregate away the transgene and memory stays. That's the only way I know to make it right now. Otherwise, for the grafting, we use stable mutants. Yeah. And the phenotype will be the same. Yes. So the question is, when we did grafting, did we do it with an RNAi plant or with a mutant? We use almost always the mutant in grafting, and we do so only so that it's simpler. With an RNAi, um, you know, the, the value, but also the disadvantage of RNAi is that no two RNAi transgenics will necessarily be the same. So if you want to standardize your experiment, it's better to use a, a null mutation. So for almost all of the grafting, we use RNAi. Now, when we had to, for Arabidopsis in that slide, when we had to move this to other species, they don't have tilling mutants for a lot of those species. So we don't necessarily have a null mutant for MSH1. In those cases, we had to use RNAi. We had to downregulate. So in, in uh, uh, canola, in uh, sorghum, um, in tomato, we basically had to rely. We have, we have a null mutant for soybean and tomato, but we didn't for the others. We had to rely basically on RNAi. So then, yeah, we used an RNAi transgenic line as our, as our rootstock. The reason I lost it, but I mean, I was just like, um, anyway, uh, the other question I had was the medical impact on the yeast. Like, how many generations do you have? So the question is in tomato, how many generations have we seen? Um, to date, uh, we've done large scale field experiments of five generations. And in fact, we've tried to put multiple generations in one field. So in other words, you saw that we had one, two, and three in one field. We had three, four, and five in another field experiment. And it's so that we can make comparisons and make sure it isn't just the field conditions that in fact it is sustaining the effect. So five generations so far in, uh, and in, then in soybean, I showed you three and four, we've taken it. I think four is as far as we've gone. I'm not actually positive because I'm not doing all these experiments. EpiCrop technology does some of these that I'm not involved in. Yeah. Um, so it's about five o'clock, but if we want to do maybe one more question, I think there was one in, on, the, uh, on the, in the chat from one of our online. If we want to maybe... Okay, so the, the question is, is it possible to read methylation repatterning footprints, memories in naturally heat stress tolerant genotypes or even at species level wild versus domesticated assuming such tolerant phenotypes result due, due to epigenetic alter, alterations? 
And that's a, that's a really good question. And of course, it's our question as well. Um, it's true that we use the MSH1 system as our model in order to develop this decoding system, but there's absolutely no reason I can imagine that this isn't going to be directly transferable. So we're doing those experiments right now. And the experiment that we're doing is still in Arabidopsis. I don't want to make too big a, a leap at one time. Um, and in Arabidopsis, we're taking Shaw, which is very, very heat tolerant and Columbia Zero, or heat and, and drought tolerant and Columbia Zero that is not. We're basically taking it through the stress, no MSH1 involved, through their stress responses, creating those, and now evaluating methylone behaviors when one sees stress and when the other is to, to basically identify that. But at the same time, I will say we've used this method in tomato, um, and we've used this method in, to some extent, soybean, but mostly in tomato, to decode the methylone there, and it seems to work fine. By fine, I mean we get almost the exact same gene networks that emerge, and the, and the network behavior seem the same. So for instance, TOR remains a central part of this, et cetera. So in that regard, now let me not say that tomato and Arabidopsis are the same. There are many networks we also see in tomato that we never see in, in Arabidopsis. And I'm assuming that there are species specific changes in stress response that we will discover. So if what you're thinking is, could you really use this as sort of a gene discovery mechanism? Absolutely. And in fact, there are companies who have contacted me to ask that very same thing. Could we just kind of capitalize on your system to exploit this? Not because we necessarily will do epigenetic breeding, but because you might actually be able to find the networks faster than we do by using a system like this. I see no reason why that wouldn't work, but it, you know, time will tell as we apply it. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity.